Good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to have everyone here again for our John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library anniversary lecture. The, the year does seem to go around very quickly, I have to say. Uh, my name is Catherine Clark, and I'm the university librarian here at Curtin University and also the director of the John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library. And um, I'm delighted to welcome everyone to this year's anniversary lecture. And in particular, I've got some special guests who I would like to acknowledge right up front. Number one on my list is Mr. Kerry O'Brien. And uh, Kerry, I'm very pleased to say, is here to present the 22nd JCPML anniversary lecture. But I'd also like to acknowledge, uh, also very importantly, members of the Curtin family who are, who are here today. Uh, so welcome to um, Barbara and Gary Davidson, and also to Bev Lane, who join us every year. And it's fantastic to have that Curtin family touch in the crowd, I have to say. Uh, Dr Andrew Crane, the Chancellor of Curtin University, is also here. Welcome, Andrew. And uh, Emeritus Professor Lance Toomey, the former Vice-Chancellor of Curtin University, is here. Welcome to you as well. And uh, Mayor Sue Doherty, from the Mayor of the City of South Perth, is here, as is the Honourable John Cowdell, retired WA Labor MP. So thank you for, um, for coming. And of course, welcome to everybody. I've named a few people, but there's a, there's a great crowd here. So in the uh, usual format, if I could get everyone just to check that their phone is not going to beep embarrassingly uh, during the lecture, that would be great. And also in the uh, very unlikely event of an, of an emergency, I think the main instruction is follow the event staff, but we do have doors both at the back at the front and the front of the, of the lecture theatre and congregating outside on the grassed area. So as we've done for uh, quite a number of years, we're recording the lecture today and it will be available later on the John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library website, which um, is always a way that lots of people like to access our lectures both at the time and, the, and then later. So uh, I'm the MC, which really means that I get to let you know that what we're going to be doing in terms of order of events is to uh, uh, have a welcome to country from um, one of our Curtin colleagues and uh, then the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Deborah Terry, will introduce uh, uh, Kerry. I nearly made you a professor there, Kerry. I was about to say Professor Kerry O'Brien. <laughs> Maybe a sign of something to come. <laughs> we'll introduce Kerry O'Brien. So if I can um, ask Anthony Kickett to come up and welcome him to deliver the welcome to country. Thanks, Anthony. Kaya. Uh, on behalf of Professor Marion Kickett, I'd uh, like to offer apologies. She couldn't make it this afternoon, but I hopefully will do a good job in her stead. Uh, my name is Anthony Kickett. I'm a lecturer down at the Centre for Aboriginal Studies. So a welcome to country ceremony gives traditional owners, uh, in this case the Noongar people, the opportunity to formally welcome visitors and people to their country, or Buja. This ceremony is normally undertaken by elders who are acknowledged as such by their family and communities. The Welcome to Country ceremony is an acknowledgement and recognition of the rights of, the, in this case, the Noongar people. The act of giving, of getting a representative who has traditional links to, as, as a, to a particular place, area or region, is an acknowledgement of respect for traditional owners, it is respect for people, respect for rights and a respect for country. The land, waterways and cultural sites are still very important to Noongar people. It is an acknowledgement of the past and provide a safe passage for visitors and again a mark of respect. The traditional country of the Noongar people covers the entire southwestern portion of Western Australia. This extends from Lehman, and Lehman in the northwest to Cape, to and beyond Cape, and in the southwest. And archaeological evidence establishes that the Noongar people have lived in this area and had possession of tracts of land in this country for at least 45,000 years. The Noongar people are one of the largest Aboriginal cultural blocks in Australia. There is no evidence that there has been any other group than Noongar in the southwest. 
Noongar are made up of 14 different language groups. Amangu, Yuwad, Wajak, Binjarab, Wadandi, Baladong, Nyakanyaki, Wulaman, Ganang, Bibulman, Menang, Goreng, Wajiri and Nyanga. Each of these language groups correlates with different geographical areas with ecological distinctions. Noongar people speak their own language and have their own laws and customs. These laws and customs were characterised by a st strong spiritual connection to country or buja. Caring for the natural environment and for places of significance, performing ceremonies and rituals, collecting food for hunting, fishing and gathering, providing education and passing on the laws and customs through stories, art, song and dance. In essence, as traditional people, we don't own the land, the land owns us. So whilst the effect of a European settlement has been profound, many significant aspects of Noongar culture and society has been retained and are still practised by Noongar people today. So Kaya, Ngan Anthony Kickett, I'm a Noongar Wajak man who also has kin and cultural connection to Baladong, Ewart and Willimon. Willimon is my grandmother's country and my father's mother. <coughs> Within the Noongar nation, and I've been asked to welcome you here today. Kaya Yorga Maman, Naj Juripan Nunuk Jinning, Naj Noongar Wajak Buja Ngala Yakin, Ngala Juripan Wanju Nunuk Ngala Noongar Wajak Buja, Nija Ngala Mort Buja Kora Kora, Nija Ngala Kala Buja Kora Wangi, Ngan Ngala. Jurupan Mort Ngala Buja Kaya. Thank you, Anthony. That was uh, that was fantastic. Uh, so Anthony's welcomed us to country, and now uh, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Deborah Terry Ao, is going to welcome everyone to the university. Thanks. Kaya, and thank you very much, Anthony, for your warm welcome to country, such an important part of all of our university events. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, so can I begin by acknowledging that we are gathered here today on the traditional lands of the Wajak Noongar people and that we honour their elders and their continuing cultural and spiritual connection to this land as we walk together on the path to reconciliation. I would like to particularly acknowledge our guest speaker, award-winning Australian journalist and author, Mr Kerry O'Brien, Chancellor of Curtin University, Dr Andrew Crane, my predecessor, Emeritus Professor Lance Toomey, always nice to see you, Lance, members of the Curtin family, distinguished guests, friends and colleagues. Welcome, everybody, to the 2019 anniversary lecture of the John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library usually referred to as the JCPML. Since 1998, the JCPML anniversary lecture has been hurled to acknowledge and to commemorate the enormous contributions of Prime Minister John Curtin, after whom this university is so proudly named. John Curtin became Prime Minister of Australia on the 7th of October 1941, and just two months later, following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbour, he announced that the nation was at war with Japan. His strength of character was evident during this difficult, challenging and dark time in our history. He worked tirelessly to unite all Australians, to secure the nation from attack and to lay the foundations for post-war prosperity. Tragically, John Curtin died on the 5th of July, 1945, just weeks before the end of the war. Curtin University established the Prime Ministerial Library to preserve John Curtin's personal papers, 
to make them publicly accessible and to recognise his very significant political and social achievements. Events such as this le lecture provide an opportunity not only to reflect on the enduring legacy of John Curtin, but also to engage with the thoughts and the views of the leaders and commentators of our time. Past lectures have been presented by a number of previous Prime Ministers of Australia, including Gough Whitlam, Paul Keating and Malcolm Fraser, as well as many other significant figures from politics, academia, the arts and the public sector. We are honoured to have as the patron of the JCPML, former Prime Minister, the Honourable Julia Gillard, who presented the lecture in 2017. In a very powerful address, she reflected on John Curtin's personal resilience and how this impacted on his term as Prime Minister. Julia is unfortunately unable to be with us this evening, but I'm sure she'll be tuning into the lecture as soon as it's up there on the web. Each year, our anniversary speaker enriches our understanding of who John Curtin was and the ongoing impact of his leadership. Last year, Stan Grant reflected on the future survival of liberal democracy, a topic that went to the heart of all that John Curtin stood for throughout his distinguished political career. And I've no doubt that this year's lecturer, Kerry O'Brien, will continue in this great tradition as he focuses on reconciliation, one of the most pressing issues currently facing our nation. Kerry O'Brien is without doubt one of Australia's most revered journalists, with six Walkley Awards, including the Gold Walkley and the Walkley for Outstanding Leadership in Journalism. In an impressive career spanning over half a century, he's worked for newspapers, televisions, uh, and a wire service, and as a foreign correspondent. 33 of those years were spent at the ABC. During this time, he worked on all of the ABC's flagship current affairs programs, including This Day Tonight and Four Corners. He was the inaugural presenter of Late Line for six years, the editor and presenter of 7.30 for 15 years, and the presenter of Four Corners for five. Kerry specialised in national politics for the ABC, as well as for the Seven and Ten networks, and he also spent time as a press secretary for Gough Whitlam. Across his career, he's interviewed numerous world leaders, including Barack Obama, Nelson Mandela, Tony Blair, Margaret Thatcher, who apparently, on terminating an interview with him in 1988, hissed, you just had to go too far. Kerry's acclaimed four-part interview series with Paul Keating was broadcast on the ABC in 2013. This series formed the basis for his best-selling book, Keating, that was published in 2015. Kerry's recent memoir on the social and political upheavals that he observed across the course of his career includes revealing insights into the rise and fall, and the occasional rise again, of 13 Prime Ministers. So it's entirely fitting to have him reflect on Australia's 14th Prime Minister, John Curtin. And it appears that he and John Curtin have a bit in common. Both were proud journalists that were not only committed to high quality journalism, but understood deeply that this lies at the very heart of strong democracies. Both were educated by the Christian brothers and so exposed at an early age to the fundamental concepts of social justice and basic fairness and the innate belief that all people are born equal. As John Curtin once implored, and I quote, we must look forward, we must seek, we must hope, but we must do this in a spirit of compassion and with a sense of inclusion. It must be a journey not only for the bold and the brave, the healthy and the strong, the whole of this nation in all its diversity, must be on board. Kerry's lecture this evening echoes this call to arms in relation to our First Nations people, the custodians of the world's longest living culture. As is always the case with Kerry, his title takes us to the very core of this critically important issue, asking what is the point of reconciliation?
It's now my great pleasure to invite Mr Kerry O'Brien to the lectern to deliver the 2019 John Curtin Prime Ministerial <laughs> Anniversary Lecture. Thank you very much, Deborah. And I've just uh, erased my timer so somebody can wave at me when I start to go over. Uh, and uh, I also would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of Noongar land um, and pay my respects to elders past and present. For the first and probably last time in my life, I'm going to start this lecture, and I'm looking to see who's actually controlling it. I'm going to start this lecture with the aid of PowerPoint. Eyes, eyes front. Now, if John Curtin were to reappear at this moment and look at the screen, he might think by the standards of his time it was a shockingly explicit picture of a woman's backside. We would have to explain to him that it's actually an expression of sympathy and respect from an Instagram user for the people who suffered the full force of the recent hurricane in the Bahamas. This lecture could take a while. <laughs> Sensitively selected from this woman's holiday snapshot catalogue. And the caption, praying for the safety of this beautiful country, hashtag Bahamas. Here's another. <laughs> My heart goes to the families that lost their homes, hashtag pray for Bahamas, hashtag Bahamas. A heart wrapped in a G-string. And another. So many houses, cars, hospitals and places all being devastated by this damn hurricane. Let's pray for hashtag Bahamas. Enough of the sideshow. Then we could, then we could try to explain to John Curtin the similarly tasteless and obliviously narcissistic Instagrams from tourists celebrating this year's September 11 anniversary on the Twin Towers site uh, with insensitive selfies, or cartwheeling through Europe's Holocaust memorial sites. We could try to explain to him how a crude, sexist, racist, venal, blatantly dishonest and anti-democratic property developer came to be president of the world's most powerful and inspirational democracy. <laughs> the nation John Curtin had turned to to save Australia from Japanese invasion and occupation. What would he make of what's happened to the world since he left it? That world had Franklin Roosevelt in the White House and Winston Churchill in number 10 Downing Street. Therefore, we'd have to also try to explain Boris Johnson to him. <laughs> With his own reputation as a liar and a flake and how he somehow managed to find his way into the British Prime Ministership or how Given his abhorrence of war and after all his decision-making agonies through World War II, John Curtin would now have to, would now want to rethink the American alliance he first nurtured. Given that that same alliance has led Australia into two newer disastrous wars, Vietnam and Iraq, both commitments based on lies and deeply flawed intelligence. For his defence of Australia's democracy in World War II and the other inspirational and courageous and principled aspects of his leadership, not least the post-war reconstruction plans he died before he could implement, John Curtin's various biographers have built a case to recognise him as this nation's greatest and or at least the most respected Prime Minister. Not the longest serving, most respected will do. But like every person in this room and on the face of the earth, he wasn't perfect, and he was also a product of his time. His time was the time of white Australia, and the time when the prevailing policies, federal and state, in relation to the first peoples of this continent were assimilationist, racist, and arguably genocidal. And his focus and energy as Prime Minister uh, were devoted to almost, almost totally, uh, to the war effort. He was never, unfortunately, allowed the opportunity to be a peacetime Prime Minister. But we can ponder on what kind of peacetime Prime Minister he would have been. And I don't have any doubt that had he been born into my generation or the generation after mine, 
and had our education and our capacity to travel the world and soak up its cultures and been vividly exposed to the deep injustices against Indigenous Australians that had been largely hidden from view, uh, he would have wholeheartedly embraced multiculturalism, he would have embraced his own region in the world, and he would have understood the whole at this nation's core that can only be filled by a genuine and practical reconciliation between First Peoples and the rest of us. The reason I believe that about John Curtin is because by his very nature he was intelligent, principled and a compassionate humanist with an abiding sense of fairness and justice. As he would have been today in a less blinkered world for all its vicissitudes and contradictions and social media vanities. And also by his very nature he was a genuine leader with the strength of his convictions. A rare commodity in politics these days on both counts, leadership and conviction. When I wrote a memoir last year built around my 50 years as an eyewitness to a remarkable and unique period of history, I was very cautious about pursuing my personal family history for the book and only committed to it when I realised after participating in the excellent SBS Who Do You Think You Are series back in 2011, just how much the story of my ancestors paralleled the story of white settlement in Australia. Five of my ten primary ancestors arrived in Australia in chains. Three from England and only two from Ireland, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> one stole horses, one stole pigs, one was a prostitute, prostitute who robbed a client while his pants were down. <laughs> Literally. One pilfered goods from the Royal Navy Quartermaster's store and one stole a wheel of cheese, which he unfortunately dropped on the foot of the shop owner who was chasing him, <laughs> although he did plead not guilty. So all that way back there was hope in the family. <laughs> all ten were pioneers who blazed trails, clashed with the real first settlers of this continent as they took their land. They bore adversity with great courage, were entrepreneurial and raised and educated their children and helped build a new nation, with little regard for those nations who were already here. These personal revelations have deepened my understanding of my own connection to this country, of the first contact between its original inhabitants and my ancestors, and how each new arrival made his or her place here and contributed to our history and our culture, warts and all. This is far more revealing, far more emotive, far more real than the scant history I was taught at school. In my case, the story starts in Windsor and Richmond, just west of Sydney, in the 1790s with William Eaton, cheese thief, and Jane Ison, prostitute, and their hundred acre grant on the Gross River near where it meets the Nepean, after gaining their freedom. They were my great, 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 great grandparents. Their son, John Eaton, with his wife, Mary Ann Onus, also the child of a convict, struck out on their own in 1831 with a grant of land in the Wollumbi Brook in what is now the Hunter Valley. Their progress north as squatters in little or unexplored country through central, western New South Wales over the next 25 years, opening various sheep and cattle runs along the way, bearing and raising children as they went, became a classic saga of courageous white Australian frontier entre entrepreneurialism as recorded in colonial history. In Indigenous eyes, they weren't pioneers, they were interlopers, invaders, thieves, and possibly worse. It's extremely well documented in the family history how John and Mary Ann built their first house in Wollumbi. Quote, the rosewood and pine used in the finishing were cut away back in the ranges to the west. As the Aborigines were still numerous in the district and those of the ranges were not to be trusted, an armed guard always went out with the men when they were felling the trees. The logs were hauled over the cliff top and shot down into the valley below. John was 22 at the time and Mary was 20. There were hints through the family history over the next 70 years of John Eaton's life, of his attitude to the people whose own ancestors had arrived here 60,000 years before them. But it's more likely than not that in the early years at least, if not much longer, he shared the view of most settlers that they were rootless, nomadic, uncivilised, inferior. A very convenient view. It would not have been convenient 
uh, to the colonial settlers to discover, as Bruce Pascoe has so brilliantly chronicled in Dark Emu, that this ancient civilization had its own sophisticated culture, its own laws, its own developed capacity for agriculture, far more suited to the environment than much of what was to follow. Its own nations that largely coexisted in peace and had deep spiritual connections, and indeed, its own capacity to put down roots and build settlements. To have known that would have made it much more difficult to justify the dispossession and worse that followed, or to live with their consciences. Over the next 20 years, John Eaton squatted on various runs north of Wallumbi to the Gwider in the central west, uh, on to what is now Lismore and Kyogle, and over untamed mountains to Mirabra in Queensland. He passed through Mile Creek just months before a group of white men, including convicts led by a local squatter, perpetrated the inf infamous Mile Creek Massacre, killing up to 30 unarmed Aboriginal men, women and children without provocation. This is one massacre that can't be denied because its graphic detail was accepted by the court, a rare one in that regard, resulting in the execution of seven of the accused, a verdict that was upheld by three Supreme Court judges. All seven confessed their guilt in the shadow of the gallows. Even so, there was a strong strand of colonial sentiment sympathetic to the cold-blooded murderers, partly reflected in the judges' difficulty finding jurors who were prepared to sit in judgment. This is what the Sydney Morning Herald had to say during the trial. We want neither the classic nor the romantic savage here. We have far too many of the murderous wretches about us already. The whole gang of black animals are not worth the money the colonists will have to pay for printing the silly court documents on which we have already wasted too much time. Edward Denny Day, the area magistrate who had led a team of police to arrest the Mile Creek killers, also described, quote, a war of extirpation along the Gwida River in which he said, quote, Aborigines in the district were repeatedly pursued by parties of mounted and armed stockmen assembled for the purpose, and the great numbers of them had been killed at various points. The Mile Creek massacre was in fact the second in the area within a few months. There was another in which possibly scores of Aboriginals were killed by mounted police, supported by squatters at Waterloo Creek, which also became quaintly known as Slaughterhouse Creek. At its junction with the Gwida River in January of 1838, it climaxed a two-month expedition by five police officers and 20 men from Sydney, after five stockmen had been killed in separate incidents allegedly by local Indigenous people on new pastoral runs runs exactly like the ones my own ancestor established on his way to Queensland. Indeed, around the time of the Waterloo Creek massacre, John Eaton may not have been too far away. The indigenous side of these stories relies on oral history far more often than not. Handed down through generations, once dismissed by the conservative historian Keith Winshuttle, rather contemptuously, as quote unquote, tales my granny told me endeavouring to negate the only, the only form of record from the Indigenous side of this narrative. But at Waterloo Creek, even a police officer who participated, Sergeant John Lee, estimated for the official record significant Aboriginal deaths. Quote, the men spread out so much that it was impossible for any one person to put a stop to the firing at once. From what I saw myself, I should say that from 40 to 50 blacks were killed when the second firing took place. The two senior officers in the party were absent from where the action happened, one of whom later said he had only seen three bodies. Windshuttle concluded in that case that therefore there was only sound evidence of three being killed. Sergeant Lee's evidence apparently didn't count. Historian Lyndall Ryan, who wrote a strongly researched chapter on the Waterloo Creek Massacre and a book of essays by 15 historians called Frontier Conflict, The Australian Experience, details the inadequacy of a belated inquiry into the incident which carried the telltale signs of a cover-up. Ryan concluded that these killings were an act of revenge. When the English Secretary of State for the colony, Colonies, Lord John Russell, read the inquiry's report, he wrote to the New South, New South Wales Governor Sir George Gipps that, quote, in the case before me, the object of capturing offenders was entirely lost sight of and shots were fired at men who were apparently only guilty of jumping into the water to escape from armed conflict armed pursuit. Ryan is now in the process of painstakingly compiling a massacre map, an important task 
with hundreds of sites pinpointed mostly down the east coast of Australia and in Tasmania, with more to come. Her working measure of a massacre is where at least six people were killed without resistance. The Eaton family history makes no reference to actual violent conflict between John Eaton and the Indigenous people in the various areas he settled, but clearly there were run-ins. Throughout the 1840s and into the uh, 1830s and into the 1840s, Eaton had taken up large runs through central west, uh, uh, the central west of New South Wales. One of them, on the Mooney River in the Murray Darling catchment, quote, on the very outskirts of European civilisation, he shared with his brother-in-law William Onus. He's said to have abandoned that property when Aboriginal people had, quote, driven off their herd of 1,100 head of cattle. There was no reference to actual fighting. After eventually settling on a 50,000 acre run outside Miraburra, John Eaton also established a sugar plantation and invested in a Pacific Island slave ship called the Jason, one of many ships that brought an estimated 62,000 Pacific Islanders, men, women and children from Melanesia to Queensland between 1863 and 1904 to work as indentured labour in the sugar industry. An untold number of them did not survive to return home. 13,000 came from the New Hebrides, now Vanuatu, which was where the Jason, quote unquote, recruited its cargo of workers. The concept of indentured labour was introduced to British colonies as a cheap labour replacement or alternative for slavery when it was abolished but it was wide open to abuse and Queensland was no exception. Theoretically, the islanders freely entered a contract to work on a plantation for a set period of years before being returned home. In practice, many of them were tricked onto the boats or brought on board at the point of a gun. Conditions varied from plantation to plantation in Queensland in the same way they did for slaves on the cotton plantations of America's deep south, from barely passing muster to wretched. On wages alone, they were shamelessly exploited. Many had little or nothing to show for their labours when they were returned home. An untold number died of disease or malnutrition, many of them buried in unmarked graves. One of the excuses for using islanders was that white men weren't suited to work in the tropics. But the hard truth is that they would not have been prepared to work for the pay and conditions to which the islanders were subjected. The Jason skipper John Coth went to jail for five years for the abduction of men and boys from the New Hebrides, but was subsequently pardoned. After the scandal involving the ship and its captain, John Eaton withdrew his investment. As my great, great, great grandfather and his growing family continued to prosper, rough justice was being meted out to indigenous people right through regional and remote Queensland. Although, as I say, I couldn't find evidence that he participated in, many, uh, of the, in the many uh, outrages and massacres, nor is there any indication that he thought any di differently to the widely propagated view in editorials and through the police culture and much of the population that Indigenous Australians were inferior, murderous, thieving and even vermin. If a single white man was killed by Aboriginals, a hundred or more Indigenous people might be killed in retaliation. And much of this extermination was carried out in particularly odious fashion. The colonists using so-called native police, usually imported from south of Moreton Bay to do their dirty work for them. In the official records, their work was referred to as dispersals. In truth, it was slaughter. In 1857, two years after the Eatons settled their cattle station west of Miraburra, 11 settlers on a property called Hornet Bank Station on the upper Dawson River, about 500 kilometres due west, including eight members of the Fraser family who ran the property, were brutally killed by a raiding party from the local Iman clan. The prevailing story for white consumption at the time was that the Aboriginal raiders were opportunistic thieves who ran off the Fraser's sheep after killing the family. Further research has thrown up other versions that the Fraser men were in the habit of forcibly taking Indigenous women, that the Frasers had poisoned to death an unknown number of Imans from, with strychnine laced Christmas pudding and or that the Fraser killings were in retaliation for the shooting deaths of 12 imams over the spearing of cattle. One documented comment from a former member of the native police read, quote, the Frasers were famous for the young gins. The news of the family massacre would have shocked white squatters and their families throughout the colony, presumably including the Eatons. The more remote the settlers, the greater the fear it would have sparked, the reprisals that followed, 
were another matter. Punitive expeditions, including squatters and native police, were conducted throughout the region, and many scores of Aboriginal people were killed at random. Accordingly, or according to the historian Jonathan Richards in his book, The Secret War, a neighbouring grazier to the Frasers named George Serracold sent a letter to his brother in England saying he and a reprisal gang, quote, killed every grown up black they found for a hundred miles over three weeks. Quote, whatever you do, be careful, Serracold wrote, as I do not wish anybody to be able to read what I have written in dealing with the savages you must make yourself feared. John Eaton would certainly have been aware of the existence of the native police who had a base in Meribah, if not a knowledge of the crimes they perpetuated in the ongoing suppression of indigenous resistance as white settlers extended their frontiers further and further into the north and west of the state. According to Jonathan Richards and other credible sources, much of the killing was completely indiscriminate. They were invariably led by white officers some with a military background. One of the earliest such officers was a man named Frederick Wheeler, who, quote, openly killed indigenous people for almost 20 years, unquote. He expressed the view in a letter that Aboriginal people, quote, must be held responsible for the guilt of others. Now there's British justice for you. That was certainly the approach taken in the Hornet Bank reprisals where native police were involved in the indigenous dispersals. About 400 kilometres north of Meribah, the editor of the Rockhampton Bulletin wrote of Aboriginal people in November 1870, they may be tolerated and treat, treated kindly as long as they refrain from mischievous acts. But when they rob, steal or murder, they must be treated as enemies of the state and shot down with as little compunction as soldiers shoot each other in battles among civilised men. This was the fodder that was fed to the minds of the settlers in the towns and the regions of the colonies at that time. This was what they read over their breakfast, lunch or dinner. The veteran award-winning Queensland historian, Professor Raymond Evans paints a picture of wider complicity. Private individuals illegally accomplished more genocidal outcomes than did the state via its military police and native police forces. But the state was complicit via its failure to prosecute Europeans for the killing, kidnapping or injuring of Aborigines." Unquote. The use of the word genocide will always be contentious, of course, but the historical weight behind the charge of complicity was strong. During my research for the book, I learnt it wasn't until 1876 that Aboriginals in New South Wales won legal entitlement to give evidence in the courtroom. Just think about that. The debate between the New South Wales Government and the British Colonial Office had gone on for 40 years before it was resolved and most of the resistance came from within the colony. Even allowing for all the exposure I've had to racism in the 20th and 21st century, including institutionalised racism, I was still shocked when I stopped to think about that, that even with every other part of the deck stacked against them, Indigenous people weren't even entitled to be heard in the courtroom. That is, if they lived to tell the tale. One argument against that right, a right for white settlers, but not those who came 60,000 years before them, was that if an indigenous person couldn't read the Bible, how could he or she swear on it to tell the truth? This is a part of the history of which most Australians are still ignorant today. Worse than that, the efforts of a small but noisy band of commentators sought to muddy the waters, mostly in the Howard era, and confuse the picture that built on our national ignorance. The so-called history wars, those efforts have now been buried under an avalanche of carefully tallied evidence of hundreds of massacres across Australia. John Howard as Prime Minister would occasionally acknowledge that Indigenous Australians had been treated badly, although I never once heard him give an example. But he always framed that acknowledgement in the prism of the past, as if we can all now move on from that legacy. But I'm sure every person in this room knows, if we're being honest, that we can't. The injustices of today may not be on the brutal scale of the massacres of the past, and the racism is not as broadly spread or quite as institutionalised or quite as naked, but they're an undeniable and significant part of contemporary Australia and they show little sign of diminishing. In 1975, as a young journalist on Four Corners, I reported on the case of an Indigenous woman named Paula Sweet. I'll never forget that name or that story. 
who according to police had been raped and brutally bashed to death by six young indigenous men. In a nutshell, Sweet was in a de facto relationship with a white resident in the town and had been killed some time after a drinking session in the Todd River. The six accused from the Papunya settlement, 200 kilometres northwest of Ellis, had been interviewed by police, signed confessions and were committed for trial. Although Aboriginal liaison officers had been available as interpreters, they weren't asked to attend. The six young men served four months in prison before the police case fell apart in their Supreme Court trial. They'd had bail applications refused five times, despite the fact that even the police hadn't opposed it on the fifth occasion. There were three elements in the accused men's favour during the trial. A sharp young Melbourne lawyer named Jeff Eames, later a Supreme Court judge in Victoria, working with the Central Australian Aboriginal Legal Aid Service, had taken up their case and enlisted the language skills and cultural knowledge of a white congregational minister named Jim Downing, who had come to Alice from his ministry in Sydney's Redfern, established an institute for Aboriginal development and taken the considerable trouble to learn the pitchin of Jarrah language. The two became convinced that the men were innocent and had been coerced into signing the confessions. The third element was that Eames persuaded Top Silky and Barker to take the case. But Jim Downing was crucial and his evidence made a complete mockery of the confessions. He demonstrated with his knowledge of the language that the concepts behind key words attributed to the accused men in the police interviews had no equivalent in Pitch and Jarra. They simply could not have said those things. Police were forced to admit that in their experience, Indigenous people virtually never sought legal assistance and overwhelmingly confessed to whatever crimes they were accused of, in stark contrast to white offenders. The compelling conclusion drawn by Eames, Barker and Downing was that there was no rape by six men in the Todd River, as alleged, and no assault that night. So if these young men weren't the killers, then who was? The real suspect, who had received almost no police attention, was Bernard Grondman, Paula Sweet's white de facto partner, who had long since disappeared. Police were deeply embarrassed as the story emerged that Grondman had a history of assaulting Sweet and that the injuries she sustained had probably been inflicted at least 10 hours after she'd left the company of the Papunya men. Ian Barker described the police practice exposed in the Paula Sweet case as a process, quote, repugnant to our system of judgment, unquote, of justice. In acknowledging, quote, absurd inconsistencies in evidence to the police that should have been picked up, including Paula Sweet's injuries, the judge said there were some things the police could have done a bit better. <laughs> Even the judge didn't quite seem to get it. In our story, Jeff Eames spoke of the likelihood that many, many other Aboriginal men were in jails for, jail for crimes they hadn't committed, and Jim Downing, earned a uh, sorry, Jim Downing urged a complete overhaul in police culture related to Indigenous citizens. Both men called for a Royal Commission. It wasn't hard to feel the burn of injustice as I stood beside the single bunch of dead flowers in the red dust at the foot of an insultingly dismissive stick in the ground marking the pauper's grave where Paula Sweet had finally come to rest. But for a brief moment it seemed her death might be more than just another incidental tragedy in Indigenous history. The story prompted the Whitlam government to announce a Royal Commission into relations between police and Aboriginal people in the Territory, but it never happened. Five weeks later, the government was sacked. I was subsequently told by an aide to Les Johnson, the Aboriginal Affairs Minister at the time, that Johnson's request for the terms of reference for the Royal Commission was still sitting in the in-tray of the department's legal advisor who had been on sick leave. The incoming Fraser government chose to drop what would have been a seminal inquiry for its time. Such are the elements of chance that decide history, or in this case, retard it. But would that Royal Commission really have made a difference? Late in 1985, 10 years later, David Ma reported for Four Corners a searing story of black deaths in custody here in Western Australia. And again, on the yawning gap between black and white justice in the nation. It took another 18 months for the Hawke government to act, but the subsequent Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody investigated more than 100 deaths in prison across the country and made 339 recommendations. The commitment of governments to those recommendations varied significantly from state to state. But there were shortfalls everywhere, and the incarceration rate of Indigenous Australians remains obscenely high today, and well over 300 Indigenous Australians have died in custody since. In 2016, Four Corners again prompted a Royal Commission with shocking disclosures 
of the treatment of Indigenous juveniles in detention in the Northern Territory. And such stories continue to this day. Let me go back briefly to John Eaton, who was 93 when he died in June 1904, three years after Federation, and nine years before my mother was born in Miribra. And he already had great-great-grandchildren by the time he died, with, according to the Miribra Chronicle, a staggering 300 living descendants. The Chronicle's obituary described him as having an iron constitution hardened by a very tough bush life. Quote, we have lost from our midst a grand old man, most upright in his dealings and generous to a fault. His honoured name will be indelibly impressed upon the history of the early pioneering days and development of Miribra and the Wide Bay District. The Chronicle described the generation John Eaton had helped spawn as, quote, an excellent group of settlers on the land, unquote. So the evidence is strong that the white society of which he was a bedrock judged John Eaton to be a good man of considerable achievement, sometimes in the toughest of circumstances, who had raised his children as an excellent group of settlers. An indigenous perspective on John Eaton is more difficult to find. The point I take from this personal family narrative is that the history of this nation post white colonial settlement is not a simple one of good on one side and evil on the other, of virtue and guilt. The deeply chequered history of colonialism per se across the world is one thing. It suited the colonial masters to see those they were conquering and subjugating as inferior beings, needing to be saved if they were capable of being saved. Terra nullius was a wonderful convenience for the British Empire in this country. The individual stories, though, of those who played their part, many of whom had no choice in the matter, are nonetheless stories of nation building. And it's important and necessary that they are rightly acknowledged on the road to reconciliation. But they will mean nothing if we, the non-Indigenous inheritors of the privilege that came off the back of that often brutal colonialism, cannot honestly acknowledge the undeniable collective shame of it all. And that's not just about saying sorry, as Kevin Rudd did on that remarkable day in the National Parliament in February 2008. And it's not just about an annual review about whether we're closing the gap. It's deeper than that, far deeper. Perhaps the greatest injustice of all from these past 231 years is that we, the perpetrators, or the children of the perpetrators, have largely not worn the shame of it. The original inhabitants of this continent, the custodians of a rich, unique 60,000 year old culture, are the ones who have been made largely to wear it. For instance, despite all that we learnt from the searing stories of the stolen generations, or should have learnt, about the massive damage done to many tens of thousands of indigenous families in the name of assimilation, racist assimilation, the system of government that rules this country is still taking the children in great numbers and still failing to solve the problems causing family dysfunction in Indigenous communities. It is the system of government that is still locking away Indigenous children and adults in numbers that are obscenely disproportionate to the non-Indigenous occupants of prisons and detention centres around Australia. It is in this context that the power of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, shaped by 250 First Nations leaders speaking in unison and putting their own differences aside comes through. I believe it is a document of integrity that demands to be read by us all and reflected on. I want to read the opening words of this remarkable document, words that resonate more powerfully and meaningfully for me for having come to understand it in a very personal way as best a white person can what this statement is about. And I would ask you to hear these words in the context of the narrative I've told today. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention coming from all points of the Southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture. From the creation, according to the common law, from time immemorial, and according to science more than 60,000 years. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, 
the ancestral tie between the land or Mother Nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil or better of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the crown. How could it be otherwise? And hear these words, that peoples possessed a land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionately, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alienated from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. How can the rest of us not respond to this? I feel no guilt for what my great, great, great grandfather or his white workers did or might have done as part of what to them was an ambitious pioneering project, but at times fearful and ignorant generation of settlers placed by history in an often harsh and foreign land whose indigenous people were deemed to have had no prior right to occupation and to be inferior to boot, where the killing of a single white person regularly excused the killing of many more black people in return, whether they had any involvement in the white death or not. But I do feel shame. By definition, the painful feeling arising from the consciousness of something dishonourable done by oneself or another. For what was perpetrated in the name of white progress and selective prosperity, of which I am a beneficiary. It doesn't mean I walk around in a hair shirt with my head hung low. You don't have to grovel in the shame. But how can you claim genuine, meaningful pride in the many notable achievements of your nation if you feel you have to hide or understate those parts of your history you don't like, but that are an undeniable part of the whole. Or worse, exploit the often ignorant racism that still remains for political gain, rather than to call it out for what it is. As a journalist, I have watched and reported on the halting steps towards reconciliation over the past 25 years in particular. The work of the Reconciliation Council, Bob Hawke's flawed attempt to negotiate a treaty that never got off the ground the Mabo decision in the High Court, the Stolen Generations report, that extraordinary march across the Sydney Harbour Bridge on Sunday, May 28 in the year 2000, and all the other marches around the country, the apology in the National Parliament eight years later. I was on the bridge the day of that march, and I was in the Parliament for the apology. I'll never forget either. Good days in the story of this nation, but we need to do and be much, much more. Much of the work of those earlier attempts at reconciliation was sabotaged by the so-called history wars and the attempt to undermine the credibility of serious academic work as a black armband view of history. There was, a, there was a division process that went on in this country that was quite destructive and I think we still share that legacy today. But for all that, I do believe that we've arrived at a moment in our history where I think we non-Indigenous and Indigenous people can now deliver the goods. It shouldn't actually be too hard, but it will still take time to get it right, particularly if we are to achieve constitutional change. But surely the greater onus falls on the non-Indigenous inheritors of the fruits of white colonial invasion to come genuinely to the party and for our national and state leadership, governments and oppositions, to be what they say they are and actually lead. This should not be allowed to become just another depressing political football. The Uluru Statement is an important and impressive start. It's incumbent on us all not just to be satisfied with news reports of what the statement says, 
but to read the document for ourselves if we haven't, understand it, reflect on it, and pass our understanding on to others. It encompasses a three-step process to genuine reconciliation measured in a seriously meaningful way. The voice to Parliament, not in Parliament, to Parliament. The Makarata or truth-telling and a treaty. The concept of a voice is not, as some are claiming, a third chamber of Parliament. It would be a representative body of First Nations to advise the National Parliament on policy that might impact on Indigenous communities. It would have no more power than the strength and integrity of its arguments. The Makarata is a concept deeply embedded in Aboriginal culture, and we've seen its application elsewhere. The extraordinary work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa after the birth of democracy there, belated, but the birth of South Africa's first genuine democracy in 1994. And treaties between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people are considered unremarkable in countries like Canada, America and New Zealand. In fact, the Waitangi Treaty with New Zealand's Maoris was negotiated and signed while New Zealand was still part of the New South Wales colony. And when it's said, as John Howard did as Prime Minister, that a nation can't have a treaty with itself, what do you think happens in our Federation when a state signs agreements with the Commonwealth? Two sovereign entities within a nation reaching an agreement. Not tough to comprehend. And it needs to be remembered, as the Uluru Statement says, Indigenous nations have never ceded their sovereignty. As it happens, the states have a big role to play in both the negotiation and delivery of a reconciliation contract. In a sense, some are starting to show the way where the Commonwealth appears to have stumbled. Victoria is more than two years into a process that will hopefully end with a treaty or treaties. They already have an independent treaty commissioner. Uh, a voice and a Makarata, or variations of, hopefully, will follow. The Northern Territory is making a similar move and Queensland is about to embark on a series of consultations in 26 remote regional and urban communities stretching from the Torres Strait Islands and the tip of Cape York down the coast and through the sprawling outback to the New South Wales border. Indigenous and non-Indigenous Queenslanders plotting their own path to treaty. And here in the West, you already have the Noongar Treaty. The bottom line is, and this is the bottom line. We will not be complete as a nation until we have resolved this and resolved it with credibility and with integrity. Where for the first time, I think we'd be able to say that the various parts of this nation have become the whole. A New South Wales Labor Premier, Neville Rann, once observed that leaders could not afford to get too far ahead of the mob. This is one occasion where I suspect the mob is actually ahead of its leaders. And I don't think leaders can afford to get too far behind the mob either. And I wonder again, if we had a leader today of the calibre of a John Curtin, how different the outcome might have been. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. What a fabulous um, presentation talk for us tonight. So thought-provoking, and I guess more than anything, it just shows us how much still has to be done. I have to put in a little plug for Curtin to say we did, um, along with uh, 13 other leading organisations, including Qantas, BHP, Lendlease, KMPMG and others um, uh, signed to support the Uluru Statement from the Heart in May this year. And, and I know personally and across the university, it's something that we're incredibly committed to. So thank you so much. I think, you know, the language, the words that you've put around it are just so important to link it back to all of our stories. So thank you again. Um, so really now we're, uh, we're just uh, going to finish up by, if I can ask the Vice-Chancellor to come forward and, and Kerry as well, if you don't mind, we'd just like to present you with a small gift on behalf of the university.
Kerry. Thanks, Deborah. Can I echo Catherine's comments? What a wonderful lecture, what a powerful lecture. There is so much there that we will all be reflecting on for so long, and it's been a privilege to have you giving this year's John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library Lecture. He would have been extraordinarily proud of your words. I am, and I hope that they will continue to change our nation in the way it needs to be. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, and thank you again, uh, uh, Mr. O'Brien. So, uh, and thank you to all of you for for coming this afternoon. I was a little bit worried earlier in the week they were fo forecasting 15 millimetres of rain today, but thankfully that's happening tomorrow. So, <laughs> it was great that you could all come. And uh, I would also like to um, acknowledge Anthony Kickett. Thank you uh, for the welcome to country, which was uh, fantastic. So much information in there and just a wonderful lead into tonight's lecture as well. And if I can uh, also uh, say thank you to the Curtin Library staff and the corporate event staff who've put the event together tonight and um, have also done a great job. So that brings our formal proceedings to a close. If I can ask you just to stay in your seats for a few minutes while the VIPs make their way out to the foyer. That's what happens when you're a VIP. And uh, then we will have refreshments in the foyer out here. And I'm, I'm really hoping that most of you will be able to stay and join us. So thank you again. Thank you.